Longhorn baseball was in action this week away from their home field. The annual Texas Relays fails to disappoint, and we'll show you what this year's Roundup weekend revealed about Texas students. The Heat, the heat. and uh, the Cavaliers. The heat and Cavaliers. This week's edition of College Press Box coming up next. Good evening, Austin, and welcome into College Press Box. My name is Henry Corwin, joined alongside Sean Mapes. Thank you for tuning in on this Monday night. A lot has happened since we saw you last week, so Sean, you ready to just jump right into it? You know what? Let's go. Let's do it. Scouts from all 32 NFL teams were in Austin Tuesday as Texas hosted the Pro Day to give Longhorns hoping to get drafted later this month, a chance to showcase their skills. For players not invited to the NFL Combine like Armani Foreman and Antoine Davis, it was an opportunity to prove that they deserve to be drafted. Puna Ford was considered a big winner by many draft analysts, running a 4, uh, yeah, 4 9 4 40 time, a 7.43 cone, and recording 24 reps on the bench press. Numbers that would have put him at the top of most defensive tackles invited to the NFL Combine. Top prospects Connor Williams and Malik Jefferson also performed well and solidified themselves as early round draft picks. Longhorns football is back already with the start of spring practices here on the 40 acres. The first scrimmage of the spring took place on Saturday at Denius Field. The annual orange-white spring game is scheduled to take place on Saturday, April 21st. It is key that the Longhorns use this spring and summer before the start of next season to reshape their defense to hopefully be just as effective as it was last season. Despite the fact that they will be missing key defenders that made them so successful last year, such as Puna Ford, Deshaun Elliott, and Connor Williams. With many incoming and returning players looking to prove themselves, head coach Tom Herman made it clear at a press conference last week that nothing is given. As we go through spring ball, our, our, our guys know there, there's no starters. There's no, spring ball is when you become a starter uh, and when you become uh, a backup, a key backup. Uh, but, you know, as you guys know from last year, I mean, it, it, we got to jog 11 guys out uh, with the first group. Yeah, but moving. in our minds, there, there really is no, there's no starters. Moving on to baseball, the Longhorns faced off against Kansas State this weekend, losing the first game of the series Thursday 5-2 to two, and winning the series finale on Saturday 9-5. to five. But let's take a look at the action from Friday's game. Here we have, we picked... Nico O'Donnell pitch for a ride. That is going, going, yabo. That one's gone. You call that one a tater from uh, Mr. McMaster right there because teammate tosses him a potato, takes a bite. How about that? Zach Zubia for the Longhorns is going to get the RBI single in the ninth as the uh, Longhorns cut the lead 10 to 4. Andy McGuire is going to come up with the bases loaded and two outs. He finds the outfield and scores. Two to keep the rally going. Longhorns only down 10 to 6 now. Now trying to tie it up. Here's Tate Shaw. Hits the gapper. That one's going to tie the game at 10. What a comeback with two outs. There you have Tate. He's enjoying himself. Now bottom of the ninth. Base is loaded. Bo Ridgeway is going to deal to Cameron Thompson. Here we go. That one up. Up. Oh. Couldn't get it. Kansas State walks this one off, walks this one off wins 11-10 in the Little Apple, Manhattan, Kansas. I am joined now by the well-renowned baseball expert here on College Press Box, Mr. Jonathan Pulasic. Jonathan, thanks for being here. Lots has happened this week in Longhorns baseball, and we have much to discuss, so let's just get into it. The Longhorns suffered their first series loss of the season this weekend against Kansas State. In the series, the second game, John, the Longhorns rallied for seven runs in the ninth to tie the game, but would still fall by a score of 11 to 10. Texas was able to get the win on Sunday to avoid the sweep, but still an overall disappointing weekend. Jonathan, what specifically went wrong for the Longhorns this weekend? Well, you have to say that pitching has been the main culprit for Texas this weekend. They gave up 21 runs over the course of three games. You're giving up seven runs a game, you're not going to win very many baseball games. Blair Henley only went three in the third innings. Nolan Kingham only went two. Those are your two aces of this Texas team. If they're not going strong, Texas really isn't going to have a chance to win. And then Bo Ridgeway gives away the game 
in the ninth, preventing Texas with the opportunity to come back and win in extras. So it was supposed to be the strength of this team. They've had a really difficult time when it comes to upping the level of quality opposition. They've really struggled against the likes of Stanford, LSU, and now Kansas State. So Texas pitching needs to step up, and they dropped the ball on this one. Well, you're certainly right, Jonathan. You know, hitting may win some games, but pitching wins championships, and if they want to be successful this year, they really got to get their pitching in order. But on a lighter note, there were some positives this weekend for the Longhorns. The men showed incredible resilience in that game on Saturday. With that unbelievable seven-run ninth inning, they were down 10-3 with two outs, and they figured out a way to, to uh, get to tie the game. And then on Sunday, the Longhorns came from behind again, and this time were able to seal the deal thanks to a seven-run fifth inning after being down 5-2 and in danger of getting swept. Was this weekend just a fluke, or is Texas the kind of team that can pull together and rally from behind? Well, I think that we saw that Texas being able to put not one, but two seven-run inning, uh, seven innings in two separate games just shows how explosive Texas can be when they put it all together. I do want to highlight two players in particular, mm -hmm. the first being Tate Shaw. In three games, he had six hits and five RBIs, and he's batting just under 300 for the season. He has a 400 on-base percentage, and he is the ideal guy to lead off for Texas. It allows the likes of Cody Clemens and Zach Zubia to get, in, to get those RBIs. The other guy I want to look at is Andy McGuire. He hasn't played these last two years, but he has been a big contributor with his bat recently. In fact, in just two games, because he only played Saturday and Sunday, he had four hits and six RBIs. He has been on fire recently, and he even got the save uh, in the Sunday game. So Andy McGuire, keep giving him the at-bats. Uh, let him, let him do his thing, and Texas just may m win some more games. No, I certainly agree with you. I think those are all great points. But looking ahead, Texas takes on the Baylor Bears this weekend in Austin. Jonathan, Baylor has been pretty up and down over the course of the season. Only one game above, above 500, but they won their series with Texas Tech. But this past weekend, Oklahoma swept the Bears. Jonathan, what does Texas have to do to get the series win? Well, I will say that Texas does absolutely needs to win this series against Baylor. If Texas is going to contend for the postseason, maybe even host a regional, they cannot be losing to teams in the back half of the Big 12. Uh, the pitching definitely has to get back on track. Blair Henley, Nolan Kingham, they have to give you more than five innings in two games total. Five innings from your two aces, absolutely unacceptable. So look for them to get back on track against a Baylor team that's had its, up, its ups and downs with its offense recently. And the offense needs to build on what they, what they showed against Kansas State, those last two games in particular. If the offense can keep rolling and Andy McGuire keeps contributing, give him more at-bats to allow him to build his confidence, and then maybe Cody Clemens and Zach Zubia heat back up after having that kind of down series, I don't see Baylor beating Texas with the way that the offense has showed out recently. I think that Texas wins the series against Baylor, maybe even sweeps them. Well, I'm sure the Longhorn fans are hoping you're right, Jonathan. Well, again, thanks so much for being here. We really appreciate it. And coming up, we'll recap this weekend's Texas Relays and how several Longhorns fared at the festivities. Stay tuned right here to College Press Box. Welcome back here to College Press Box. The Clyde Littlefield Texas Relays were underway where more than 7,000 athletes converged to Mike A. Myers Stadium for four, day action, for four days of action at one of the most elite track meets in the nation. Daniel Shee was there to cover this weekend's action. Fans returned to Austin for the 91st time last weekend for another year of great track and field competition. The Klein Little Field Texas Relay was held for the 91st time here at the Mike A. Meyer Stadium. It's the second largest track meet in the country, with thousands of athletes competing representing 25 countries. With five Olympians competing, including the current world record holder and former gold medalist, Povo Elite was no doubt one of the most anticipated events on Saturday. Armand Duplantis, an 18-year-old from Lafayette High School, broke his own world junior record by clearing 5.92 meters, and Renault Lavillier recounts his growth. And it was 
fight like that, <laughs> and jumping three, three meter eighty, something like that, and uh, you know, year after year, he improved everything, and now he's a big part of the of the top of uh, of the uh, the world walker. So yeah, it, it's great for him. It's but when asked why come to Austin to compete in the Texas Relay, Ronald Lavilny says Texas Relay has a reputation of great competition and crowd atmosphere. It's crazy atmosphere. Everything is is made for you to to compete and to be the best. And, uh, and you know when year after year you saw competition, you saw great results, you saw uh, you know people who talk to you about that uh, with every, every time positive uh, uh, positive feeling. I mean, at one point you say, I have to go there. I have to see by myself what how it is looks like. The Texas Relay also provided great competition atmosphere for 100 meter hurdle winner Russell Burton. It was amazing. I mean, just just having this atmosphere of the greatest collegiate athletes, high school athletes and pros. It's a good feeling. However, Texas Relay is also an opportunity for athletes to get in shape for future competitions. No, it's March 30th or March 31st, whatever it is, so a lot of us are juniors, seniors, we're getting to the level where we really want to be our best in May and June. So, uh, you know, this is a big meet for us to represent at home, but we're really kind of looking forward to later in the season, so this is kind of just our first opener, kind of stepping stone for later in the season. Other Longhorn winners include Trippet Perry in the shot put rain and Haley Krauser in Javelin. From the Mike A. Myers Stadium, this is Daniel Shee. College press box. The Longhorn men couldn't handle the hungry team of Tulane this past Thursday. Fresh in Tulane's mind was their heartbreaking loss in last year's NCAA championships against the Longhorns. The Green Wave came into Texas fiery on all cylinders, and before the Longhorns knew it, they had suffered a 4-0 loss. Tulane got singles wins from Louise Ehrenbush, Ewan Moore, and Constantine Sm Schmidt. The Longhorns are now 12-4 on the year, which is still good for 15th in the nation. Texas's next match is Saturday, April 7th against TCU, which is the start of their Big 12 conference play. The women's yeah, tennis team, like did the oh, things today to gain the women's, not just in the doubles, but the whole time. Then we came out in the singles, we were, we were down right out of the gate, and we were just fighting just to stay in the match. And we never, never did anything tonight to really take control of the match. So um, it was just, it was pretty poor uh, tonight, to be, to be honest with you. This is a good team, but we haven't been consistent enough to say that we're a great team. So uh, we've got a, some great opportunities here down the stretch. We've got to put the work in, and, and let's see what we can get done. But uh, yeah, pretty disappointed at, that uh, we didn't play with a little more fire tonight. The women's tennis team made easy work out of the Florida Gators on uh, on Sunday with a 4-0 victory. It was their ninth straight win of the season, but just their first win against the Gators since 2005. Texas got big singles wins from the current number one ranked player in the nation, Bianca Tirati. After cruising through the first set, Tirati won a hard-fought second set to take the match by a score of 6-1, 6-3. The Longhorns are now 14-4 and ranked seventh in the nation. Their next match is Friday, April 6th, when they take on TCU at home at the Texas Tennis Center. Texas softball competed in a series against Iowa State in Amos, Iowa this weekend. Texas completed the series sweep with an 11-4 win with sophomore Kaylin Washington hitting two home runs, including her first career grand slam to go with five RBIs. With the victory, UT registered its first seven-game win streak since going unbeaten over the first 12 contests to open the 2016 campaign and is now 6-0 to begin Big 12 action for the first time since 2013. Their next game is in Houston versus the University of Houston tomorrow at 6 p.m. Senior Texas women's golfer Sophia Schubert scored a one over par 73 on Friday to conclude play at the 2018 ANA Inspiration, won the five LPGA majors at the Dina Shore Tournament Course of Mission Hills Cl Country Club in Ranchero Mirage, California. For the event, Schubert totaled the uh, total of five over par in the first two rounds. She would miss the weekend's cut. She totaled six birdies over the course of the two rounds. For Schubert, it was her second LPGA ma uh, major after having also participated in the Yvonne Championship this past September. 
86 of the world's best golfers embark on Augusta National Golf Club this week for the 82nd Masters. Former Longhorns Jordan Spieth, Dylan Fratelli, <laughs> and Jonathan Vegas will tee it up in pursuit of the Green Jacket. But also in the field this week is Texas senior Doug Gill. He will compete as an amateur after receiving the invitation following his runner-up finish in the 2017 U.S. Amateur. Gim has been a leader for the Horns since he arrived on the 40 Acres four years ago. And now he'll test his game against the best in the world on one of the golf's biggest stages. Warriors can't describe the, the feelings that I have, uh, just knowing that my name will be called on that first tee sometime on Thursday. And uh, I, just, I just can't wait. I'm, I'm really excited to, to be there and, and to, uh, to show them uh, what I'm capable of. Coming up next on College Press Box, we cover the exciting action from this weekend's Final Four games. You won't want to miss it. It is not March anymore, but the madness is still brewing in April. Welcome back to College Press Box. I'm Steve Helwick alongside Thomas Fitch. The women's final four was no disappointment. In fact, it was historic. The luck of the Irish prevailed as Notre Dame's Arike Ogunbowale nailed back-to-back -back game winners, one to take down mighty UConn, and then a buzzer beater from the corner for a three to beat Mississippi State for the championship. The men's final four also tipped off in San Antonio this weekend on Saturday. Here's Thomas with the Michigan Loyola call. Loyola Chicago facing off against Michigan, trying to continue their Cinderella run. Marquise Towns getting the Ramblers going early. He would finish with eight points and seven rebounds. Mo Wagner's gonna go to work here in the paint, gets the board, gets the put back. We will have more on Wagner coming up later. Cameron Crutwick trying to go up against Wagner. Tough shot, gets to go. Uh, Loyola would lead 29-22 at the half. They'd extend that lead to 10, but Moritz Wagner, he tells Crutwig, get out of the way, slams it down. Clayton Cup Cluster with the shot, trying to give Loyola some pad, and they would need all the padding they could get because Wagner got hot. The three there, then Jordan Poole, he can't get it to go, but Wagner does, gets the bucket to fall, and the foul. The bench loves that. Then with three minutes to play, Mo Wagner, Mo Buckets. That bucket would be the dagger in the Ramblers postseason dreams. Michigan goes on to win 69 to 57. The win places Michigan in their first championship game since 2013. Let's head back down to San Antonio to see who they'll face. You have a 3-11 there. Here's a one versus one Villanova on Kansas battle of two successful college basketball programs. Villanova's getting it early with a three. This time Colin Gillespie from the corner, and it is 22-4. That three actually breaks an 11-year-old NCAA record for most threes in a season. Kansas with an attempted comeback here. This is about as good as it gets for the Jayhawks all night as Yudoka Azabuke posterizes Villanova. But the Caps would be back. Jalen Brunson from the top of the arc right here. Villanova shooting like the Warriors or Rockets tonight, just hitting three after three. 15 point lead for the Cats here. Villanova, this one's from the Riverwalk. Eric Pascal throwing a stone into the water. Splash, they're up double digits. This time Villanova's actually going to attempt it too. Villanova, an FCS team up double digits on Kansas. It looks like football season in Lawrence. Pascal hits a three from the corner there. Money, Villanova finishing duties. DiVincenzo and Pascal for another two. And Villanova puts away Kansas 95 to 79 as Jay Wright and the Wildcats make their second final four in three years. So the history books will be rewritten on this Monday night. You have the 2016 champion Villanova Wildcats. 2013's runner-up, John Beeline and the Michigan Wolverines. Both teams have had plenty of March Madness success lately. But how do you see the team stacking up in tonight's game for the entire 2017 this 2018 season? Well, the X factor for Michigan is uh, who we've, we've seen a lot of highlights from already. Mo Wagner, he had 24 points, 15 rebounds in the game. Going up against Nova, a small lineup, but they can shoot the three. But if they can't get the threes to hit, and Michigan dominates in the, in the paint, they have a chance 
to, to win. Another X factor, maybe not as impactful in the game, Duncan Robinson, um, not a starter, but he comes off the bench. Fun fact, Michigan 29-0 when he scores six or more points. So if he gets close there, Nova better start sweating. You present Mo Wagner, I'll present Villanova's big guy. Eric Pascal, six foot nine. he'll do a good job of containing Wagner, probably the Villanova's best option. He also showed off his versatility offensively last game. If you saw the highlights, he had a lot of dunks there. He hit four out of five threes. That was a season high. He also had a season high 24 points in that game. He should be able to contain those offensive rebounds that Wagner kept getting. He just... Wagner posted a stat line only Larry Bird and Akeem Olajuwon have done in the Final Four. So with that being said, who do you think? Do you think Wagner and Michigan will win, or do you think the one-seed Villanova gets their second title in three years? I like Nova by four. I think uh, it's a really offensive game. Let's say Nova 79-75. to 75. How about you? Villanova hasn't played anyone really close this tournament. They've won every single game by double yeah. digits. They basically just won a Big 12 title, too, and we've been talking <laughs> about how tough that conference is all year. Uh, Texas Tech, West Virginia, and Kansas all consecutively. And I think that Villanova is going to win this one about, it'll be low scoring like most championships. I'll say 65 to 54. And Michigan might be Nova's first true test. We'll see you tonight, though. Yeah, we will see. It's been a great March for basketball. Uh, anyways, when we come back, we're going to look ahead to the coming week in Longhorn Sports. Welcome back to College Press Box. Thanks for uh, joining us on your Monday night. Let's take uh, a look at what action is coming up in the week. We have softball at Houston at 6.30. That's on Tuesday as baseball will go to uh, A&M Corpus Christi at 6.35. Wednesday, you got softball versus UTSA. That's going to be on Long Court Network. Volleyball versus A&M. Also on Longhorn Network, a little double feature action. And then you Friday, uh, uh, going through the weekend, you have baseball against Baylor and softball against Samford. And that's all we have for you tonight. Thank you for spending your Monday night with us. Please follow TSTV Sports on social media to keep up with everything happening across the 40 acres. And don't forget to tune in Wednesday night at 9 for College, uh, College Crossfire, hosted by Mark Skoll Jr. For Henry Corwin, everyone in studio and in master control, I'm Sean Mapes. Good night.